YouTube live, sorry. Greetings everyone. Welcome to the second day of our three day short term awareness course on cyber crimes. Before we begin with the formal session, I would like to welcome Professor Shizue Linaldo Snail Kamatus and introduce you to the WCSF and the speaker. So World Cybersecurity Forum is an international region cyber consultancy and web community that improves cybersecurity awareness and acts as a source of technological information for professionals, students, teenagers around the world. Our organizations offer a blend of original content from IT professionals, peer-to-peer -peer advice from, uh, from the largest community of the IT leaders, and an extensive library of professional resources from leading IT industry vendors. The short-term course on cyber crimes is a part of WCSF's Cyber Crime Program 2021, which is a global initiative to support emerging trends in the cyber law, cyber crimes, and cyber security. Increasing the level of cyber awareness through education and training can be an effective way to, to encourage the adoption of security tools, which leads to the safer use of technology. In today's session, speaker will discuss uh, uh, cyber terrorism, online frauds, uh, cyber security, as well as digital privacy. So uh, I would like to introduce Professor Shizwe Snail Kamtus. In an, he is a director of Snail, uh, Snail Attorneys at Law. He's also a adjunct professor at Nelson Mandela University. Our speaker holds a graduation in law from a university of Petroa, uh, Pretoria, within ta tax law and cyber law electives, and also an LLM from the University of South Africa. He is still the international coordinator of the Africa Center, African Center for Cyber Law and Crime Prevention, based in Kampala, Uganda. He is also a co-editor and the author of third edition of Cyber Law at South Africa 3. And he is currently involved in the writing of a fourth edition of the Cyber Law at South Africa 4, which will be released within a month. He is also a member of the Board of Advisors for Cyber Bricks Project. So it is a great pleasure to have you. Now the board is completely yours and you can start with the presentation. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Akash. Good evening, everybody in Delhi. Good evening, everyone joining us from the world. Um, our internet connection wasn't too good earlier on. So I'm just going to appear for now so that you can see me. This is my face. Um, that is the presentation for today. So I don't want to waste a lot of time. Um, the, the outline of my presentation today will be the Council of Europe Cybercrime Convention. That's part one. Uh, part two, it will be the South African Cybercrime Act. Um, part three, the data protection in South Africa. And the last part, international responses to cyber warfare and cyber terrorism. You will note that um, South Africa, Brazil, India, China, uh, and Russia, as well as South Africa, are all BRICS countries. Therefore, the South African cybercrime legislation and the South African data protection legislation will definitely be of value to anyone who is either in India, in China, or in Brazil, and as we also have mentioned in Russia. So let me start off by telling you about the Council of Europe Cyber Crime Convention. So the Cyber Crime Convention, or better known as the, the Budapest Convention, right? This was a convention that was drafted almost 15 years ago in terms of which the Council of Europe wanted to create a model law or a convention that can be used to draft cyber crime legislation. Interestingly, as much as it's a European document, there are several countries around the world that have signed the convention, such as South Africa, uh, like I said, Brazil, the United States, and several other countries in, in Asia as well as in Africa. So I, I just want to take you through 
the principles um, in the convention. So the first part of it are offenses against confidentiality, integrity, and availability of computer data and systems. This relates to um, crimes pertaining to illegal access of uh, data, um, illegal interception of data, um, in other words, illegal access of computer systems, illegal access of data, illegal interception of communications that are taking place between persons. Um, that is what uh, this particular section is outlawing, right? Then whilst we are on that topic of um, that category of offenses, um, it is also important to mention that we then have also the illegalization of data interference. So if anyone uh, interferes with data, in other words, makes data not be able to be usable or deletes it, deteriorates it, or alters it or suppresses it, he will be guilty or she of an offense. Then we also have system interference. We've heard a lot about ransomware, denial of service attack, anyone who damages, transmits malicious uh, software, uh, deletes information, deteriorates information, or suppresses data will be guilty of a criminal offense. I hope I'm not going too quick. Um, I'm just trying to manage the time properly. Right, then we also have misuse of devices. So this particular category is a category of uh, devices that were actually designed for a good purpose, but either reverse engineered or used for a bad purpose. Um, the definition of device uh, includes a computer program, um, a computer program designed specifically for uh, doing these criminal offenses, um, a computer password, access code, um, or any hardware or software that can assist you in breaking the law. Then we also have uh, computer-related offenses. So these are offenses that are done with the assistance of the computer. Computer-related forgery, that is straightforward, is forgery done online or using a computer. Computer-related fraud, is fraud using a computer or a information system. Then we have the third category, content-related offenses. This is very important. This is the outlawing of child pornography. In South Africa, a child is anyone who's under the age of 18. However, you can get married when you are 16. However, child pornography relates to any um, images produced of a child making pornography, anyone who makes it available, anyone who distributes it, um, anyone who procures child pornography or even possesses it will be guilty of a criminal offense. Yes. Title four, not so important as it relates to uh, the criminalization of the uh, not respecting of copyrights. We know people are copying music, people are copying videos, people may even be uh, copying this particular seminar once it's on YouTube already. Uh, but the intention there was to outlaw um, the unlawful use of copyright. Anyone who attempts or abets um, in, 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 in the making of a cyber crime is, is guilty as the criminal. And we have an interesting concept now of corporate liability. Where now um, a company or the head of a company if he or she failed to take certain steps or encouraged criminal activity, then that particular person will be guilty of a criminal offense. Now, what are the lessons that we have learned from the cybercrime convention? Um, they're very simple. We must criminalize illegal access, illegal interception of data, illegal interference with computer systems, in authentic data, in other words, data forgery, uh, child pornography, and interference. So this is what we've learned from the convention from a substantial law perspective.
Um, I hope the connection is, is, is well. I've just switched on the video so you can see me again. I know it is very boring to listen to slides and not see a face. So um, yeah, that's what we've learned from the cybercrime convention as a whole. And the, the convention goes further. It talks about expedited preservation of stored computer data. So um, in the olden days, police would have problems investigating cybercrime because by the time they get there, the data may have been deleted or no longer be there. So the Budapest Convention encourages the expedited preservation of computer data, be it even traffic data by service providers. And as well as the ability to approach a court of law, in South Africa, you can also do that in terms of the common law, to ask a court of law to please uh, order a party that may have information regarding a cyber crime to make such information available. Last and least also the measures regarding search and seizure of stored computer data, as this can also become critical in the investigation of cybercrime. Uh, this also then allows the real-time collection of traffic data where a cybercrime may still be going on in terms of the offense or the interception of content data where a court order has granted uh, or allowed such um, interception. You must remember interception is not allowed. Um, it breaches the right to privacy. Um, so that is the position. So we now have the new Cybercrime Act um, of 2020. I see I made a mistake. I said 21 there. It was, uh, it was a bill in 21. It became a law in 2020, the 1st of July. Similar to the first day our Protection of Personal Information Act became enforceable. But I will talk about the POPIA uh, a little bit later. So why was it important that the South African law be redesigned? It's, it's quite obvious. We now have the fourth industrial revolution. We now have COVID-19. These are fertile grounds for cyber attacks, cyber fraud, extortion, malicious damage to property, child pornography, and other online activities that are deemed as illegal. So previously we had the Electronic Communications Transactions Act. There was a specific chapter that dealt with that, but it was felt that uh, we need a new piece of legislation that can cover uh, cybercrime in total. So our piece of legislation has got six parts. Substantive cybercrime, uh, what we call malicious communications, anyone who attempts to do a cybercrime, uh, competent rulings, sentences, as well as uh, court orders to protect victims. Uh, in other words, victims of uh, cyber criminality, it protects them as well. I'm going to try and, and cover them briefly because we still have two, two segments to do. So, section two unlawful uh, securing of access, similar to the Budapest Convention. Anyone who hacks a computer system, um, steals computer data, is guilty of an offense. Section three, unlawful acquisition of data. Section four, anyone who overcomes the security measures or protection measures to get to the data is guilty of an offense. Section five now talks about interference with data. So anyone who interferes with data uh, and, and uh, in terms of six, um, we, we define it further. If you interrupt the computer system, the functioning of a computer data storage medium or a computer system, if you compromise the integrity or the availability of the computer system, you will be guilty of an offense. Anyone who sells, acquires, makes available any passwords or access codes illegally would likewise also be guilty of a criminal offense. Right, so let me take you now to section eight. Section eight and nine and 10 is cyber extortion, cyber fraud, and cyber forgery. I think those are relatively straightforward, but now we have what we call aggravated offenses. So if you commit any of the cyber crimes, in sections three, five, six, or seven, the ones I just mentioned to you, 
and it's a restricted computer system. So what is a restricted computer system? It's either a bank, a organ of state, a court of law, uh, and you have breached the security measures, you will be guilty of a bigger fine um, or, or a prison in, in, in imprisonment. Second category, malicious communication. Anyone who incites people electronically to cause damage to property uh, will be guilty of an offense. Anyone who, by way of um, unlawfully and intentionally disclosing a better message and threatens someone's life or someone's property will also be guilty of an offense. Uh, some interesting provisions. Revenge porn. So I always say, I don't understand why people uh, take pictures of themselves and videos of, um, in, in an intimate situation. Um, but in any event, for those who do take those pictures and those videos, and maybe you're not with that lover anymore, and that lover shares that uh, a picture or that video um, you know, in bad faith, he could also be guilty of a criminal offense. So sentencing now is very tough. We have sentencing now from five years to 10 years. And in case of the um, um, uh, revenge porn and aggravated offenses up to 15 years, okay? Now, if, if, if someone is doing revenge porn or is threatening your life electronically or your property, the court, whilst the criminal investigation is going on, the court has the right to now grant a protection order against the perpetrator. So that is very, very nice. To stop the perpetrator from sharing the, the video of the pictures or to stop them from making those threats. Our police have now been given bigger powers to investigate, search and seize and access computer data. Uh, the police now no longer necessarily need a warrant, uh, to uh, arrest someone that they suspect of cyber criminality. And service providers now have an active duty to assist law enforcement with the necessary information um, to uh, do the um, criminal investigation and prosecution. And the courts can also now be uh, approached uh, without an affidavit, an oral application for a preservation of data by a service provider. Chapter five talks about mutual assistance. So the police in South Africa can work with the police in India or the police in India can work with the police in Germany. Um, in other words, we have a multi-agency um, approach, which is what we need. Chapter six now means we have a focal point for cyber crime. The days where you go to the police station and the policeman does not know what cyber crime is are a day of the past. There will be a dedicated number, a dedicated email address that will deal with cybercrime. And like I said, um, electronic service providers, banks, anyone who has been hacked now has an obligation to re report cybercrime. Now, it's not just cybercrime. We have the Interception and Monitoring Act that prohibits in, uh, unlawful interception unless you have a court order. We also have um, several cybersecurity policies. We've now also heard that South Africa is drafting a new cybersecurity bill as well. So we'll watch that. The prevention of organized crime, in other words, money laundering, um, the use of cryptography um, in, in um, um, what do you call this, pyramid schemes, that will also be prosecuted as well, as well as online harassment, the harassment of children the harassment of persons using either Facebook or Twitter or other means um, to harass people. Child pornography has also been outlawed. Um, anyone who uh, does child pornography with a child who's younger than 18, engaging in a sexual act, an act of penetration, sexual violation, uh, a masturbation, stimulation, and, and the list is quite long. Um, such person will also be prosecuted. So now that we've dealt with computer crimes, let's talk about the Protection of Personal Information Act. 
uh, just quickly, we've got three role players. The data subject is the person to whom the personal information belongs to. The responsible party is what in the GDPR they would call the data processor. That is the party who processes the personal information of the data subject. And then the operator is what we would call um, the, 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 the data processor on behalf of the data processor, which would be then the um, a data controller. So that is just a change in that. What is personal information? Personal information is any personal information that makes you identifiable. Please note in South Africa and only in South Africa uh, can also corporate companies be the subject matter of data uh, protection. We also uh, protect special information in the GDPR, they call it sensitive, which would be religious, philosophical, race, ethnicity, trade union membership, political persuasion, health information, your sex life, um, safe for, uh, as well as your criminal behavior, unless the courts need to deal with it. So we talk about processing. We don't say you use the data, you process the data. And on the screen, you can see all the, the, uh, the acts of processing, any operational activity um, that concerns personal information, collecting it, receiving it, recording it, retrieving it, modifying it, storing it, collating it, distributing it in any form, merging, linking, restricting, erasure of personal information. Those are all um, acts of processing. Briefly, we've got eight conditions, so eight principles, accountability. If I take your personal information, you are accountable to me as the data subject. Processing limitation, you may only uh, take my information either with consent or if there's a legal justification, in other words, a law that allows that, you must directly get it. And you must only take as minimal information, don't take uh, uh, inadequate, irrelevant, and excessive information. That's a very beautiful one. Purpose specific. If you take my information for a specific purpose, you cannot now go and use it for another purpose unless it has been de-identified for statistical, historical, and research purposes. Further processing is also only allowed with consent or if the, the purpose that you are processing was compatible with the initial purpose that you collected for, right? So that is condition four. Condition five, you must keep complete, accurate, anonymous leading personal information. Condition six, openness. We all know the cookies on the website that notify us we are collecting personal information. So that relates to that. And then condition seven, we have the condition that relates to security and safeguards. You must have technical and organizational measures to protect the personal information, you must do an internal and external risk assessment um, as to uh, you know, what measures you must take to protect the personal information. A responsible party and an operator must have a written agreement to agree to the processing. And uh, in the event of a data breach, you must notify the data subject as well as the data protection authority of the data breach. And lastly, data subjects have the right to correct or delete information that is uh, incorrect. Now, last but not least is the international responses to cyber terrorism. So cyber terrorism is not something um, new to us. We know that terrorists now use cyber infrastructure to commit wars, um, in other words, cyber warfare, or also acts of cyber terrorism. We've heard um, things like uh, power stations in Iran being attacked. We've heard uh, the Paris attacks where everything was planned nicely on Google. Uh, in other words, something that's important like Google Earth was used for criminal actions. And you know, there is a international movement to have a convention and it is only a draft. 
unfortunately. So cyber terrorism is defined as the intentional use of a computer system to commit uh, violent terrorist objectives. Cyber terrorism is uh, separated in effects-based terrorism and intent-based terrorism. So effects-based is where you um, use the electronic infrastructure to effect a, a, a cybersecurity system or, or, or anything that uses computers to function intent-based cyber terrorism is where you plan. You use Google Earth, you use whatever beautiful technology that we have now um, for, for locating people and to moving the Earth to plan and commit crimes. Cyber warfare is a new battlefield. We all know previously we had battlefields on the grounds. Then the human beings became smarter. They started battling on the water, in the boats, and they started battling with planes in the skies. And in, in the 70s and 80s, they started battling in space. We all know the Cold War, the Russians and the Americans. And now we have cyber warfare. And that is a new uh, uh, battlefield. It has no rules of engagement. So um, if you kill the civilians or you kill a computer system of the school or of a hospital, there are really no rules of engagement uh, such as in real life war, where you don't kill the civilians, you don't attack the churches, um, and you don't uh, most definitely uh, bomb schools. So uh, just some concluding ideas for you. Uh, in order to deal with um, international cyber terrorism, we need to have multinational legal assistance. There must be extradition agreements that will allow for cyber terrorists to be extradited. Um, and like I said, the normal rules of engagement of war <laughs> do not apply. And um, I think cyber deterrence is very, very important. And this comes from the word nuclear deterrence from the olden days where we were trying to move away from um, nuclear powers and nuclear weapons. And this is based on cyber resilience, cyber attribution, as well as a country's uh, offensive and defensive uh, cyber uh, warfare uh, capabilities. Um, I left uh, slightly some minutes. So we're slightly, I think three minutes or so early. Uh, I don't know if my host Akash has got any questions that he would like to ask me in connection with today's presentation. Akash, are you there? Yeah, sure. So firstly, I would like to uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the, from the bottom of my heart on the behalf of our organization and our attendees. And please accept our uh, appreciation for such an excellent presentation and an exciting speech. Now, I would like you to take a few moments to respond to the questions from our attendees. And I will be picking some questions from the YouTube channel. So uh, the first question is, what provisions are there for the transnational offenses? Okay, so for transnational offenses, there is a provision, and, and I, as I said, I had to go quickly through the, the sections. There's a provision that talks about if you commit a crime in South Africa, or you commit it on a South African plane, or a South African boat, or you begin the crime in South Africa, you end it in another country, for instance, in India, then we have extraterritorial jurisdiction. Or if you start the cyber crime in India, and it affects us in South Africa, or you do the crime on a Indian aircraft coming to South Africa uh, that is registered in South Africa, you would still have extraterritorial jurisdiction. So that's a beautiful part of our new Cyber Crime Act, um, giving us a long arm to prosecute anyone who does cyber crime either within South Africa or is starting it from South Africa affecting other countries. Thank you, sir. So the next question is, does the international response to cyber terrorism and cyber warfare are applied in India too? Like I said. Okay, so the question is, I'm know, currently there's a discussion uh, around 
around the world to try and, and come up with a convention, an internationally accepted convention. Um, the convention has not yet been drafted fully, uh, but hopefully once there is an international convention, we hope that all the countries in the world will sign up to that convention as well. Thank you, sir. Is there any international cyber treaty which is applicable to almost all the countries, irrespective of being a member of that treaty? Akash, you broke there. You said, is there an international what? Yes, sir. Is there any, any international cyber treaty which is applicable uh, which is applicable to all the nations irrespective of whether the country is a part of the treaty or not? Oh, no. Currently, the UN are, are busy trying to draft a cyber crime and cyber security convention, but it has not yet been executed. So for international best practice, currently, we all follow the Council of Europe Cybercrime Convention, the Budapest Convention, and several countries have signed it. Uh, I think even India has signed it. Uh, I'll, I'll just have to double check. Okay, sir. So, so the next question is, where should a state uh, file legal suit for the cybercrime committed against it by another state? Like I said, you know, cyber criminality is, is, is trans-jurisdictional. So, you know, if If the perpetrator is in your country, then obviously you can file charges against him, even if the perpetrator committed the acts elsewhere. And I think that is what we're trying to do now with multi uh, multinational assistance to, to ensure that what is a cyber crime in America is a cyber crime in South Africa, so that cyber criminals cannot run or choose uh, forums where they think that there is no cyber crime protection. Yes, sir. Uh, next question is. Sir, are the cyber offenses between nations arbitrable? Just repeat that, Akash. Are cyber offenses between nations arbitrable? Are, are cyber crime offenses between nations? Are arbitrable. Oh, attributable. In other words, can you attribute cyber crime offenses? Yes, of course. You, you, you can attribute a particular cybercrime offense, either to, like I said, to a company, to a person, um, that is also possible. So, sir, I would like to ask a question, like it's from my own, uh, my side. So, so, like I know that you are also a professor uh, for the cyber laws and you're also practicing advocate. So, so what is the difference between the practice and the theoretical life when we practice cyber law? <laughs> so, I was very lucky. When I started practicing, I was in a general law firm, but my principal at the time, he really saw something at me and he, he told me to start writing. So I started writing a lot. Initially, I didn't get a lot of cybercrime work or cyber law work. It was only after I wrote my first textbook, uh, Cyber Law 3, and started writing articles when uh, government started taking me serious. I started doing consultation work for several ministries in South Africa. I'm currently also still with the information regulator. I was also with the National Cybersecurity Advisory Council. So it's been a bit of a mixture of life. Um, um, I'm, a, I'm a traditional lawyer at the office. I go after social media companies. I, I do all sorts of stuff there. And when I'm sitting for government, I advise government. And, and when I'm teaching, I'm Professor Snell. It was great, really. So, so then last question is, what sort of methods are used by the authorities to monitor terrorist act internet activity? I think monitoring of terrorist activities is the job of the Secret Service, as well as the police intelligence. And, and I think the, the intention is that later on, cybersecurity legislation must have provisions dealing either with cyber warfare or cyber terrorism. I don't imagine a cybersecurity legislation of any country 
not having provisions that deal with cyber terrorism and cyber warfare, not in 2021. Okay, so, so, so we're receiving more questions. So do you have a time to uh, take more questions or we can end the session? Um, maybe what we can... Okay, sir. So, so the question do, is... Gosh, we, we can have a, a, a second session. We can have a second session. Sure. Maybe you can take some of the sure. questions. Um, time, unfortunately, is not on my side today. <laughs> okay, sir, we totally understand it. So we totally understand yes. it. Yes, but what we can do, Akash... I'm very happy to present again for, for your audience. Maybe you can ask your audience to send the questions to you, and then we can have a, a session specifically for, for me to answer the questions, if you don't mind. Sure, so that will be a great pleasure. So, so thank you for speaking with our attendees and answering all of their questions. Your presence in the three-day cybercrime awareness course and wise remarks aided in amplifying our cause to develop cyber awareness in the best possible way. Thank you for taking time of your busy schedule to deliver this lecture. And it was a pleasure having you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Akash. It was a pleasure. If you ever need me again, please let me know. Sure, sir. Sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much.